Okay, so we've seen that carboxylic acids can be deprotonated, and carboxylic acids and derivatives can all be attacked by nucleophiles and then reform the carbonyl. Remember when we talked about aldehydes and ketones? We saw that those could be attacked by nucleophiles, and we had to rank them in order of reactivity. We had to say when are they more or less reactive, depending on whether they have carbon chains or hydrogens. We have to do the same deal here and ask which of these are more or less reactive. Especially we should focus on the acid derivatives and ask which of these are more or less reactive than the others. Acyl halide will be the most reactive. Yeah, that's right. Then the anhydride. That's true. Then the ester. Yeah. Then the amide. Yeah, well, what a coincidence. Okay, that's right. So yeah, these are listed in order of reactivity. And the reactivity is very important here. So when you make a list of acid derivatives, it's helpful to always write them like this, from, high, from highest reactivity to lowest reactivity. Another way to put that is that at the top is more unstable, and at the bottom is more stable. Remember that we usually put more stable things at the bottom because they're called lower in energy. Yeah, so these are unstable and the carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acids are a little bit difficult to compare with these, but uh, we'll, we'll try to get to that in a second. Let's hold off on that for the time being. So um, remember that we can use, these are like wild cards. The L groups are like wild cards. We can use a nucleophile to go from one place to the other. But is it easy to move up this table or down the table? down. That is, if you have an acyl halide, you can make any of these things down below. But it's not easy to make an ester into an acyl halide. That would be moving up. Usually you can't move up in the table. You can only move down. Usually you can't move up in the table. You can only move down. So we can easily make an acyl halide into any of these other compounds. But actually, generally speaking, you cannot make an amide into an ester, or an hydrate, at least not in one simple step, because that would be moving up. Usually, we don't move up the table. All right, now we need to explain why that is. Um, so someone already said this is the most reactive. There's really two different reasons why this is more, the most reactive. Do you remember any reasons why this would be reactive? I'm remembering the test question. What else? <laughs> Now I think we're getting to that test question. Oh, yeah. Okay. What so is it that makes this more? What does it make this less stable? It's more electron. It's more the CL is more electronegative, so it it withdraws electrons more, making the carbonyl more el electropositive. Great. And that makes it um, more electrophilic, which makes it more um, like able to be attacked by nucleophiles. That's a really good explanation, yeah. If you think about it, that's the same type of explanation that we used for ranking aldehydes and ketones in reactivity. Remember, the reason that all of these are nuclear, the reason that all of these types of compounds have electrophilic carbonyl carbons is this delta, is this positive charge on the carbonyl carbon. So anything that removes more electron density from the carbonyl carbon makes it even more reactive. And anything that adds electron density to the carbonyl carbon makes it less reactive. So because this is electronegative, it's pulling even more electron density away from the carbonyl carbon, making it even more positive, making it even more electrophilic. And then it said something about pi bonds. Can you? Sure. Uh, we can get to that in a second, actually. So um, how about, say, this oxygen down here? Now, um, would this oxygen be donating electrons to this carbon or removing electrons? Removing. Because it's electronegative, right? Now things become more complicated, though. By induction, it's removing electrons. But by resonance, it might be donating electrons because of its lone pair. So let's go through that. Again, the real theme for this whole course now is resonance. Remember that one of the explanations for why the carbonyl carbon is electrophilic is because there's a resonance form where it has a full positive charge. There's a resonance form where the carbonyl carbon has a full positive charge. And that's still true in all of these. There's always a resonance form where the carbonyl carbon has a full positive charge. Okay, 
So there's still, here's another resonance form of this anhydride showing why this carbonyl carbon would be electrophilic. However, now there's also a resonance form Now there's also a resonance form where it doesn't have the positive charge anymore. And that make, means that this resonance form now has less weight in the overall picture. Remember, what's the real molecule like? The real molecule is a blend of this picture, this picture, and this picture. Well, the more other resonance structures there are, the less weight this picture is going to have. This is the picture that makes this electrophilic. So the more alternatives there are, the more alternatives there are where there is not a positive charge on this carbon, mm -hmm. the less positive charge it's going to have. Now, this is where the class gets frustrating because all the time previously, last semester, we thought of oxygens as electron withdrawers. But that was because they were always too far away from the scene of the action to donate by resonance. When the oxygen is connected to an atom, it actually is mainly electron donating because of resonance. So this is a, a, a complication that we'll have to deal with in the course. This will come up again when you're talking about benzene, too. Um, so um, if the oxygen was further away from this carbon, it would clearly be pulling electron density away, of, away from it by induction. But when an oxygen is connected to an atom, it actually can be mainly electron donating by resonance from its lone pair. Uh, and oftentimes, resonance effects are usually stronger than inductive effects. So it's the resonance that wins out here. The oxygen is mainly donating electrons to this carbon. The resonance effect wins out over the electronegativity effect. OK. Um, so we can use these resonance forms here. If you're trying to do a test question like this, it's always good to actually draw the resonance structures as part of your explanation. All right, so now we've explained why this anhydride is less reactive than the acyl halide because it has this extra resonance structure. Okay. Uh, a question that should have popped up, though, is why couldn't the chlorine do the same type of resonance structure? After all, the chlorine has lone pairs as well. And the answer is resonance um, uh, stabilization works best when atoms are similar in size. Resonance stabilization works best when atoms are similar in size. It's easy for the oxygen to donate electrons to the carbon because they're from the same row of the periodic table. They're similar in size. Chlorine is so much bigger than carbon that the resonance structure that it could form doesn't get very much weight. Resonance structures that involve elements from different rows generally don't get that much weight. That would have been hard to predict ahead of time. So anyway, this oxygen can donate electrons pretty easily to the carbon by resonance because they're about the same size. They're both from the second row of the periodic table. But it would work with like fluorine then? Uh, presumably, yes. However, first of all, fluorine is so electronegative that in that case, I think this would still be electron withdrawing because the electronegativity would beat out the resonance. Also, um, this just is not a common compound. I don't know whether it's not stable or doesn't come up, but for some reason, I've never seen an acyl halide with a fluorine over here. So I don't think it's very unlikely you'll actually see this come up. Um, I've never actually seen a problem where there's a fluorine here. Um, maybe this is just not a common compound. Uh, but if it did come up, fluorine is so electronegative that it might still be fairly reactive um, because that, the electronegativity there might actually beat out the resonance. All right, but in general, um, in general, we've seen in the course that usually the halogens we're focusing on are chlorine and bromine and sometimes iodine. Fluorine doesn't seem to come up much in Ochem. It certainly doesn't come up much in this context. Okay. So we won't worry about that too much. Okay, so um, that explains the stabilization here.